Before I start today's worship, I would like to invite everyone to just spend some moment of silence to reflect upon both the sessions that have been given by Reverend Tim. And I especially want to quote yesterday, last night's session, where it talks about gratitude, it talks about showing thanks to people around you, to your family, and most importantly, showing thanks to God. And as we prepare ourselves for this time of worship, let us bring our hearts to really thank the Lord for the things that He has done for us. It could be this one, it could be within these few weeks or even these few days. Thank Him. Thank Him that we are able to be here today. Thank Him that we are able to wake up, to eat breakfast, to have a time of fellowship and now to have a time of worship to praise Him thank Him come let's pray for the Lord we are thank you we are thankful we thank you Lord for so many things in our lives that we keep on forgetting the little things, the big things, we really thank you, Lord. But most importantly, we thank you that you have sent your son to die for us. And it's because of this death that we are able to receive salvation. It is because of this death we are able to receive grace and mercy. It is because of this death we now understand how undeserving we are and yet how much you love us. Help us to grasp this idea. Help us to fully understand what is this grace that's been given from you to us. So that we are able to put into our hearts, put into our mouths and actions and extend this grace to many more around us. We thank you, Lord. Let's try to sing our first song as we thank the Lord.
because of his death we are able to be here today. It is because he lives we are able to face everything in our lives, knowing that we have already won this victory. So let us sing this next song, Because He Lives.
turn our eyes to you. children's program. You can follow your teachers there and uh, enjoy this morning's uh, session. Can I invite our Reverend Tim to uh, come in front here? So, uh, so we've been learning more and more about Reverend Tim and yesterday we heard that his favourite country is Malaysia and the reason is because of his wife, right? Okay, so I think it's, uh, it would be good if you could uh, tell us a little bit more about your family and also what you and your family enjoy doing together. Oh, okay, so I've got uh, my wife's name is Xu Man. She's Malaysian Chinese. She's from Shiraz, uh, and uh, we have four kids together. Uh, they are nine, seven, five, and three. The eldest is a girl, and then three boys that like to run riot in the house, etc. Uh, so yeah, this is this is our our, our family. Uh, 
I mean, we, we like to do a lot of things uh, together. Of course, the, mostly we do what the kids want us to do, you know, which means going to the park. They like to go swimming, uh, these types of, of, of things. Uh, they also like to play board games. They're kind of into risk at the moment. Uh, but we never finish the game because one of my youngest sons will just sweep the board halfway through and then there'll be some kind of uh, world war in real life, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll uh, pass the time now to Reverend. Okay, well, good morning again. Great to be with you. Hope you got some sleep last night. Ready to go for another day. We are thinking about grace field service. There's an outline on page 21. Uh, and you'll notice as we go through this talk today that there are some minor variations between your outline and what I will talk about. Uh, don't let that worry you. Uh, just consider what you see on the slides is the new and upgraded version, okay? You can copy down the corrections if you want to as we go through. Well, let's, uh, let's pray and, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get into God's Word. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for how you have served us through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we thank you that uh, he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So we do pray now that as we reflect on how you have served us, that you would be moving us to serve you in response. We pray that in response to your grace, we would grow in service. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The importance of why. The importance of why. Uh, one of the most important tips I've learned as a Christian leader is to always focus on the why. Why are we doing this? Our natural focus is to focus on the what and to focus on the how, but not to focus on the why. So you're having a church meeting, uh, you prepare the agenda, you list out all the what's, and then you have the meeting and you talk about all the how's, but you forget, why are we having this meeting at all? And why are these things on the agenda and why are they uh, important? You're preparing your Sabbath school lesson or your Bible study. Uh, we focus, okay, I need to teach this passage. This is how I'm going to teach this passage. But we also need to think on, on the why as well. Why am I teaching this lesson? Why am I serving in this ministry? Because the thing is, once you forget the why and you're just going through the what and the how of things, well, that's very quickly when Christian ministry starts to fall apart. We see two, we see, uh, two ways that this often happens. The first thing is, if you forget the why, ministry will often become a duty. Uh, we serve, of course. We're, we're on the roster, after all. We need to do our job. Uh, we do it because we have to do it. We're assigned to do it. But we're not really very joyful about it. Maybe we feel tired. Maybe we feel burned out. Uh, maybe we do it because we're afraid of losing face if we say that we can't do it anymore. Maybe we, we're worried we'll be judged by other people if we're not serving like other people is, is serving. And so what, for whatever reason, we keep going on. We're doing the ministry where we're doing our job, but the joy is not there anymore. It's a, it's a, it's a burden. We feel jaded, perhaps even bitter or angry as we are serving. Uh, maybe we want to give up but we don't. Maybe we think, why aren't others pulling their weight? Why do I have to do everything? Why can I never get a rest? And all these things start to go through our mind because we've forgotten why we're doing it. We've forgotten God's grace. Well, secondly, forget grace and ministry will quickly become me-focused. Uh, we serve in ways that are convenient to us. Uh, we serve in ways that will generate the results that we want. And maybe we serve because we expect to receive appreciation from others. We want to be thanked for the sacrifices that we are making. Perhaps I think if I serve in this way, well then I will be given more responsibility in the church and then I can change things in the church to be more in line with how I want things to be. So I'm serving, yes, but it's really more I'm serving myself. Uh, and then perhaps for some of us, there is a reluctance to serve at all. 
Uh, in our church, we hand out these serving forms from time to time. Uh, we want to uh, find out how people best want to serve. So we list out all the various uh, ministry opportunities in our church, and there's, there's many of them. There's at least 40 different options they can choose from. Things like Sunday school, Bible reading, welcoming, cooking, transport, social media, administration, evangelism. And so there's a whole long list of different things that people can do to serve. And uh, they all rate it from zero to four. Zero is, I never ever want to do this ministry or I'll drop down dead. And uh, four is, yeah, I'm so passionate about this ministry. I'll do it all day long. And what's really interesting is how many people put zero for many, many, many items. Not even a one, but zero. Because I guess our default is we want to serve in areas that we feel comfortable. Now, I'm actually very encouraged by our, our church, how, how servant-hearted and sacrificial people are. Uh, the number of uh, people who put zeros is actually less. But many churches suffer from what we call the 80-20 problem. 80% uh, of the people do 20% of the work. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. So there's a few committed members who are doing everything. They're running here and there. And then the rest are doing very little at all. But if that's the case, we need to ask, well, what's my motivation in coming to church? Am I coming for Jesus? Or am I coming for me? See, forget the grace. Forget the why. And ministry can very quickly become me-focused. So here's the, the key point I want us to grasp this morning. You can see it on the screen. The Graceful Church will embrace an attitude of humble sacrificial service towards others in response to God's grace and expect nothing in return for their service. Well, before we begin, it's important to clarify what the Bible means by ministry. I think many of us get confused by this. The word ministry simply means servant. So a minister is a servant. The prime minister is the prime servant, you see. Uh, and that means Service, ministry, is not something that only Christian leaders do, but it's something that all Christians are meant to do. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, we read, He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So ministry is something that the saints do, and saints here is not talking about, you know, St. Mary and St. Paul or something like this. Ephesians 1, 1, it's the whole church. Christians are saints, God's holy people. And the point is, ministry is not so much what is done by the word ministry leaders here, the apostles, prophets, etc. Ministry is what the saints do. Ministry is what the church does. The job of a church leader is to equip the saints, the church, to do the ministry. So all Christians are called to serve uh, in response to the gospel we are to serve the Lord Jesus. We are to do so without any expectation of return. We don't do it to get praise from other people. We don't do it to get power and influence. We graciously put the needs of others before our own because that is what Jesus has done for us. So the first point then this morning, why we serve the greatness of Jesus' sacrifice, why we serve. So we serve as our joyful and willing response to the grace that we have received. Now, our motivation is grace, not performance. Now, we've seen in the first talks, isn't it, that we're saved by grace alone. Uh, salvation is God's gift to undeserving sinners. Ephesians 2, by grace you are saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It's not a result of works so that no one may boast. And yet we've seen that it's very easy in the Christian life to go back to a life of performance, to go back to a life of, of works, to start trusting again and again in the things that we have done to make us right with God. And it's very easy to think that way about our ministry, isn't it? About our service. Perhaps we start thinking to ourselves, now oh God, I've done so much for you. Look at all the Bible studies I've done. Look at all the money that I've given to the church. Look at all the sacrifices that I have made for you. God, you owe me. You owe me salvation. You owe me blessings. Good health. 
Good job, all that. And so suddenly our ministry becomes a way of us meriting salvation, you see. It becomes a kind of works righteousness that we use to try and earn salvation from God or to, to demand blessings from God. And, and, and very soon we become proud of what we've done for the Lord. And we start to look down on other people that seem to have done less for the Lord than, than we have. And then we become bitter because we're doing so much for the Lord and other people aren't pulling their weight. And you see, very quickly, all of a sudden... The gospel of grace is out the window again and works has come back into the church. It's now a gospel of performance where you and I need to earn God's approval and the approval of one another by how well we are doing with our ministry. And it's inevitably very destructive, isn't it? Well, do you remember the, the teaching of the Lord Jesus in Luke chapter 17? He says, Any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him, Where, when he's come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me, dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterwards you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what he was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. See, God doesn't owe you anything. You see that? You owe God everything. We are sinners. We are unworthy sinners. We deserve judgment and hell. That's what we deserve, isn't it? Even the fact that we are able to serve God at all is His grace to us. See, ministry is not something that we do to earn merit from God. God does not owe us blessing or salvation. It's a gracious privilege that he gives us as his unworthy servants. And so the essence of ministry is not self-service. It is self-sacrifice. It is not about power and greatness. It is about Self-serving humility. I mean, other person serving humility. Self-effacing humility. In Mark 10, the Jesus' disciples come with a request. They say, say this. Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. It seems that they've forgotten who is the servant and who is the master, isn't it? They want to be the Lord. They want Jesus to be the servant. And Jesus promptly corrects them, doesn't he? Verse 42, Jesus called, to him, called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be the slave of all. And so the gospel completely overturns human views of greatness. The first is the one who makes himself the last. The greatest is the one who makes himself the slave of all. And so the one who is the most glorious is the one who will bear the shame of the cross. See, at the, at the heart of Christianity is the recognition that we are no longer the center of our lives. We renounce self. To serve King Jesus. And so we embrace a life of self-sacrificial service of other people. Now I'm sure that there's a lot of people who've served in many ways to make this kind of care happen. It doesn't just happen, does it? There's the transport, the games, registrations, Sunday, uh, the, the, the Sunday school program outside, music, uh, many other things as well. right? And that's really encouraging, isn't it? That, that's the sign of the gospel at work among us. That is glorious. That is great. When the gospel so works in our hearts that we serve among others. But we need to be reminded of why we're doing it, don't we? Because when I get tired, when ministry starts to get hard, and when no one notices and no one comes up to me and says thank you for what you've done, it seems like it's not appreciated all the sacrifices that I've made. Well, it's very easy, isn't it, for it to be, become about me again. 
And I get bitter and angry because I really want people to appreciate me and approve me. Or I begin to think of church as some kind of career ladder. I'll say yes to this ministry because I want to get to that ministry. I want to get on the preaching roster. I want to be the, the life group leader, the elder, uh, and so on. The Bible reminds us true greatness is about service. It's, it's not about getting power. It's not about getting control and recognition and glory from other people. It's about service, sacrifice for the good of others. And that's the example of the Lord Jesus, isn't it? He finishes here, Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for, for many. That Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, he came into this world to sacrifice himself. He came to die for us on the cross. To ransom us from death, that we become his people. See, Jesus is the greatest, isn't he? Because Jesus is the greatest servant who did things not for himself, but for us and for his Father. So, as we come to Philippians chapter 2, Paul holds up the humble sacrifice of Jesus as the motivation for our own humble service. He says this in Philippians 2 verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. You see what Paul is saying here is, he's saying think about the mindset of Jesus. Think about how Jesus lived in humble service, counting others more significant than himself. Think about how Jesus looked not to his own interests, but to the interests of others. And in response, embrace the same mindset of humble, sacrificial service. He says in verse 5 there, Have this mind among yourself, this mind of other person-centered service. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who... Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Uh, for all eternity, Jesus was in the form of God. That he, he was equal to God. He was fully divine. He was the second person of the Trinity, forever in relationship with the Father in the unity of the Spirit. The point is, if anyone deserves to be worshipped, to be served, to be exalted as in, in greatness, it is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul reminds us, he didn't cling to all those things. He didn't cling to his glory and greatness. He traded his heavenly throne for a dirty manger. He traded the worship of angels for a life of suffering. And he traded his, his glory for the shame of the cross. The king of the universe made himself a servant. And of course, Jesus' humble sacrifice doesn't end with his birth. It continues to his death. Verse 8 says, Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I mean, crucifixion was a torture that was reserved only for the worst of criminals. But there was Jesus, abandoned, betrayed, broken, first for you and me. Jesus served us in the greatest possible of ways as he took the punishment for our selfish rebellion. And that amazing grace that he has shown us is the motivation for our service. We are called to embrace the same mindset of, or same attitude of self-sacrificial service as Jesus did. And it may sound difficult. The world around you will think that you are insane. Uh, perhaps if you have unbelieving parents, they will let you know. Why are you spending so much time at church doing all these things instead of working on your studies and your career and so on? They'll think you're, you're crazy for sacrificing for the sake of others. But the gospel tells us this kind of life of self Sacrificial, humble service is worth it because Jesus didn't stay dead on the cross, did he? Paul reminds us that God exalts the humble. 
The first will be last, but the last will be first as well. Verse 9 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him, bestowed upon him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, if you just look at uh, uh, life in this world now, that humble sacrificial service, that just looks stupid, doesn't it? But if you zoom out to eternity, well, it's the only logical way to live your life, isn't it? Because in the end, on Judgment Day, God will destroy the proud. He will exalt the humble. And those who have followed the Lord Jesus and embraced His life of humble, sacrificial service, well, we will be exalted in the end. Jesus is the greatest servant, and it is His servants that is the motivation for our service of Him. Let's go to the second point, how we serve. What will such a life of humble, sacrificial service look like? Let's come back to verse 3. It says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others, you can go to the next slide, count others as more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So uh, true humility is, uh, or humble service, is not just pretending that you're bad at something. It's not uh, Li Chong Wei saying, oh, you know, I'm hopeless at badminton. There's so many other players that are better at badminton than me. And, you know, that's Lim Dan and, you know, I'm hopeless. You know, often we do that, isn't it? You say, you know, you, 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 uh, you cook some food or something, and say, oh, people say, oh, that food's great. And you say, no, oh, no, this is terrible. Other people can cook much better food than me. <laughs> But why do you say that? I mean, it's, it's a false humility, isn't it? Because you're just fishing for them to say, No, no, really, it's, it's, this is the best food that I've ever eaten. You're, you're practically Jamie Oliver and so on. This is what we're really after, isn't it? That's not true humility, is it? Humble service is when you are focused, not on yourself at all, but on others. Kim Kelly calls it self-forgetfulness. So humble service is when you are an introvert, but you push yourself to welcome a new person to the church. Humble service is when you decide to help someone with their assignment, or maybe their work, instead of just focusing on your own. Humble service is when you get home tired from work, and you decide to help wash the dishes. Humble service is when you take the time to listen some, to someone who needs support and prayers rather than watching YouTube. Humble service is when you use your time and money to benefit others rather than rent, you know, purchasing the latest device for yourself. Humble service is when I stop thinking, what's in it for me? And I start thinking, what can I do for you? Humble service is thinking about yourself less and thinking how you can serve others. Now Jesus teaches this in a very powerful way on the night before he died. In John 13, Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, he humbles himself like a slave to wash his disciples' feet. And we should remember that washing uh, the feet was a, a, a job that was so low it was only reserved for slaves. I mean, and one of the things that's uh, that our kids love to do is just they, 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 they take off their slippers and they just run around bare feet in, uh, in the various coffee jams. And, you know, Penang, there's a lot of old uncles and aunties in the coffee jams. And they, they look on in horror as, at the fact that they're walking around with no shoes on their feet. I mean, their feet are, are, are black and they just don't know what to do about it. I mean, the last thing that you can imagine one of those aunties or uncles doing is getting down, getting out the wet wipes and in you know, cleaning their feet. So in Jesus' day, washing the feet was a job that was very lowly. But what does Jesus do? He washes their feet. He pursues sacrifice instead of power. He pursues humility instead of glory. He pursues love instead of self. We read in John 13, verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. 
You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. The Lord Jesus, their teacher and master, possessing all authority from God himself, steeps down in humility. Serve. And he teaches us. If we are to be his disciples, then we are to do the same. We are to sacrificially love others as he has sacrificially loved us. He continues in verse 15, I've set an example that you should do as I have done. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. So if our master Jesus is willing to humiliate himself like a slave to serve others, if our master is willing to wash his disciples' feet, and not just that, if our master is willing to embrace the shame and humiliation of the cross to take away the punishment for our sins, how much more should we love and serve others like him? I mean, if Jesus has done that for us, would we dare to suggest that any ministry is beneath us? Will we dare to think that because I'm a leader, I cannot stack the chairs? I cannot wash the dishes? I couldn't push the PowerPoint slides? That might happen in the world, isn't it, where leaders are served, usually, rather than serving others. But it cannot possibly happen in the church, can it? If we, had, if we know the humble, sacrificial love of Jesus, no task is too menial, no ministry is too unimportant, no task is beneath us. It doesn't matter whether I'm a pastor, or an elder, or, an, or a life group leader, it doesn't matter what my position or title is. If I'm being washed, loved by Jesus, then I'm going to love and serve others. So let me ask you, how are you going in your life of humble, sacrificial service? Are you willing to humbly serve, even in the most minor or menial of ways, because you love the Lord Jesus? We will only humbly love and serve others to the extent that we have grasped Jesus' own love for us, isn't it? So again, let me encourage you over these remaining days to stop and think for some time about the love of Jesus for you. To really reflect and ponder what he did for you on the cross, despite your unworthiness. And then to think, how can you respond in humbly serving others? Now, of course, putting it into practice is going to look different for every one of us. Uh, if we are one of the leaders in the church, then certainly it will mean that we will view our position as a way of serving others and not as a way of power and control. Certainly it will mean that we will serve for the good of others, that we will give our time and energy without expecting appreciation or return from the congregation. We will love with a deep and sincere love for people that flows from Jesus' own love in our hearts. But whether we are leaders or not, all of us are to love like this, isn't it? It's not only leaders who are called to serve. In whatever fashion it may look like, in our home, to sacrificially serve our family. It's hard as parents, isn't it? To sacrificially serve your children. In our class, sacrificially serving our classmates. In our workplace, sacrificially serving our customers and colleagues. More than anywhere else, we are to love our fellow Christians in the church. We are to help one another. We are to visit one another in hospital. We are to pray for one another in our struggles. We are to rebuke one another when we go astray. We are to use our money and time to meet the needs of others. And we can serve in various formal ministries, of course, as well. We can do singing, slides, PowerPoint. Uh, Bible reading, Sunday school, social media. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do, isn't it? Whatever it may be. How are you going in your humble, sacrificial service of others? 
And this part of that service is using our various gifts to serve each other. It's interesting in Romans 12, as Paul spells out the life of spiritual worship that we are to live in response to the mercies of God in the gospel, the first thing he starts with is using our gifts to serve one another. Look what he says in Romans 12. He says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if serving in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And what Paul is saying here is that we've all been given gifts. We've all received God's grace. He's, he's equipped us in various different ways to serve. No one is left out. Grace is given to every person. There's all, we all have particular things that we can use to serve other people. We all have opportunities to do good for the church. We're all important. We're not all the same, but we're all important. And, and it's good that we're not the same. Right? Uh, your gifts are different to my gifts. My gifts are different to your gifts. And that's a good thing, isn't it? Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? I mean, it'd be a very strange picture, isn't it? A body that was all just made of eyes all around, uh, all, all ears all around. As it were, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. I mean, I think if you only uh, imagine your hand was a foot then it would make it a bit challenging to drive a car, isn't it? Uh, or to eat your nasi lemak. God makes us different. That is a good thing. However God has graciously gifted us, we are to use our gifts to serve. We are to think of how what God has given us and to think how we can joyfully use those things for the sake of others, whether it's leading, serving, encouraging, giving, helping, those are the things he lists here. How can we use those things to serve others instead of ourselves? What's the purpose of our gifts? Now, they're not to make us proud, are they? I mean, oh, look at how good I am at preaching. Look at how good I am at music ministry. No, 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 no. They're not to make me feel good about myself. Don't boost up my self-esteem. They're not to show that I'm more spiritual than you. They're not to gain position or status. They're not to assure myself that I'm a Christian because I'm doing ministry work. 2 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians 12 says, To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And whatever gifts we're given, they're given for the common good, which Paul later explains, you can see there, is the building up of the church, building people up. To maturity. So God has gifted us all, we're all valuable, we're all important, and in response to Jesus' sacrificial service of us, we are to stop and we are to think, what can I be doing to serve God's church? How can I use my gifts to serve? How can I be a good steward of what God has given me? Peter writes this in 1 Peter 4, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. It's helpful, isn't it? Because it reminds us the ultimate purpose of all our ministry in the end is the glory of God. God is so worthy of our praise. And so let's not squander our gifts God has given us. And so on that point, I want to end uh, this talk with the final point, the goal of service, the eternal joy of the master. I want us to turn to the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25. Uh, it's a parable that reminds us of the importance of serving King Jesus while we wait for him to return. Jesus begins, verse 14, The kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, 
to another, two, to another one, each according to his ability. And then he went away. We saw yesterday, a talent's worth a lot of money, isn't it? It's the equivalent of 20 years wages. How much is that in ringgit? A few million ringgit, maybe. Jesus entrusts these talents to his servants to be used while they wait for his return. Now, he's not talking about doing literal business here, is he? He's not, he's not saying, look, you know, you need to go out into the marketplace. We need to go out into the marketplace and we all need to go and make money for Jesus. That's not what he's talking about here. What's Jesus' business? Jesus' business is to seek and save the lost. That's why he's on the journey to the cross here in, here in Matthew's Gospel. If we are his servants, that's our business too. The point is we have to use whatever Jesus has given us to prioritize our preaching of the Gospel. Use whatever resources he's given us, our time, our money, our energy, our gifts, and so on. All of these, we are to use them for the advance of his kingdom while we wait for his return. And so we see the first two servants, they put the master's gifts to work, they bear much fruit. Five gets five more, the two gets two more. But then there's the one, isn't it? The one who doesn't use what God has given him, who buries it. And then the master returns. Verse 19, after a long time, the master of the servants came and settled accounts with them. He who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more. Saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you up at much. Enter into the joy of your master. It is reminding us of the joy of the, of the goal of service, isn't it? The goal of service is the joy of our master. We serve in thankfulness for all Jesus has done for us. We use everything that he's given us for him. And our reward is to share in his joy. Every prayer, every invitation to a non-Christian, every word of encouragement, every Bible study we lead, every youth class, every Sunday school lesson, we're told here, it's all noticed by King Jesus. In His grace, at the end, He gives His commendation. Well done, good and faithful servant. We will share in Jesus' perfect <coughs> happiness. And I have no doubt that we will begin to taste the joy of serving Jesus in the present too. But of course this parable focuses on the third servant who doesn't serve at all. It highlights the tragedy of doing nothing to serve King Jesus. So verse 24, he also who received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I hid. I went and hid your talent in the ground here. You have what is yours. So the master returns, and he finds that his lazy servant has done nothing at all. And what's his excuse? The master's severity. Is the master being severe? All we've seen so far is his extraordinary grace, isn't it? Is he gave all the talents, and then said, Welcome! You enter the joy of your master. He's been, he's been very generous, isn't he? It's your severe. The master delivers his judgment. The master answered him, verse 26, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I scattered no seed, and then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. The reality is that this wicked servant has a baseless excuse. He looks like a servant of Jesus, but he's not really a servant of Jesus. He's rebellious. He's lazy. If he really knew the grace and generosity of the Master, he would have responded. The point is this, that the true servant of Jesus does more than just show up on Sunday, tick the church box off, 
go home. Do nothing for him with their time or their energy. Such a person has not grasped the grace of the gospel, not grasped the depth of what Jesus has done for us. And the severe judgment that then follows is a stark warning. It says in verse 28, Take the talent from him. Give it to him who has the ten talents. To everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Cast the worthless servant to the outer darkness. In that place they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus is saying, if you don't serve King Jesus, one day you lose your opportunity to serve him. Your talent is taken and judgment follows. Because a refusal to live a life of humble sacrificial service to Jesus, it just shows that maybe you're not his servant at all. You don't really know him. You don't really know his grace. So if you know the grace of your master, then don't waste your gifts. Use it all in serving him. Jesus wants us to maximize our gospel ministry for him. He wants us to use our money to invest in the kingdom, to use our lips to speak to the lost, to use our gifts to serve one another in love. That is the right response to the grace of our master. Well, we need to wrap up. Let me finish with three final exhortations. Firstly, never forget why. Forget why you are serving, and it will be joyless and difficult, and you'll burn out. You'll give up. Always remember why you serve the humble sacrificial service of Jesus. Secondly, never make excuses. It's easy to think of them, isn't it? Other people are better at serving than me. There's too much going on for me at work. I just need a rest. Now, I'm not saying that there's never a time to take a rest in ministry. Of course, we're human. We all need that sometimes. There's different stages of life, isn't it? Sometimes our ministry is just trying to survive getting the children to go to bed. We understand that. But don't make excuses to not serve him at all. And then thirdly, never give up. Now some of us have been serving for a long time. We just had the 60th anniversary. Some of you have been there nearly from the start. I don't know, is there any founding members here? Maybe we think as it's, it's time to pass on the baton, right? But let others serve. Elders, pastors, small group leaders, whatever it is. And you know what? That may well be true. We don't want to occupy positions forever. We're not indispensable. We can retire from position, from particular positions if it's best for the church. Yes. But we must always remember we never retire from being a Christian. We never retire from serving Jesus. I want to tell you about our kid's pediatrician. His name is Dr. Chu. I think there's a photo there. Him. That's not our child. I got it from his Facebook page. <laughs> he's, been, he's been seeking to serve Jesus all of his life. He served sacrificially as a, as a doctor. He served faithfully as an elder in his church. Uh, he's done all kinds of mission works for Christ. You name it, Dr. Chu has done it. He's now in his uh, 60s, and I always feel guilty when we go to see him because he's very chatty and all the other patients are out there waiting, <laughs> queuing. And he's, you know, we, we just talk about life and ministry while they're all waiting. The, the poor kids with fever coughing outside. <laughs> so what does he say now that he's in his 60s? Does he say, oh, I'm looking forward to retirement. Now I'm looking forward to going on endless cruises and overseas holidays. I'm looking forward to kicking back and relaxing and watching Olympic Games 24-7. I can't wait to retire. Is that what he said? <laughs> this is what he said. He said if God grants him another decade, he'll make his last 10 years his best for Jesus. He said his goal is to do more for Jesus in the last 10 years of his life 
than all the other years before. Not out of a sense of trying to earn his way to heaven, but because he loves his Savior. I just think, what an inspiration. We must never forget why we are serving. Jesus is the greatest. He sacrificed everything for us. He calls us to follow him, embracing a life of self-sacrificial service. It will be worth it. Well done, good and fair, sir. Enter the joy of your master. The graceful church will embrace an attitude of humble, sacrificial service towards others in response to God's grace and expect nothing in return for their service. Well, let's pray that uh, the gospel will bear this fruit among us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus did come not to be served, but to serve. We thank you for his great humility. He laid down his life for us on the cross. Thank you that he has washed us. And so we pray, Lord, even now you will impact us afresh with the love of Christ. We pray that you would melt and transform our hearts by your grace. That we may respond in the same kind of <coughs> sacrificial service of others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.